Well, today I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And I want to conclude this three part message to this series, God's Blueprint for the Family, as we talk to as we talk about God's instructions for children and parents today. And speaking of children, I want to wish my daughter Anna Marie a happy birthday today. She's turned 15. So um, happy birthday, Anna Marie, and uh, pray for Michelle and I, 15. <laughs> Remember when she was just born, time flies, but we're grateful for our children as I know that you are grateful for yours as well. All right, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Let me invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, I have to say that as a husband, hearing a sermon dealing with what it means to be a godly husband or being a parent, hearing a sermon about parenting is tough, but even more tough than having to hear a sermon about being a husband or hearing a sermon about being a parent is having to preach a sermon on being a husband or being a godly parent. And so I say that just to say that uh, as we look at God's uh, words and instruction for children and parents, uh, I certainly by no means have this all figured out. Um, I know my children would love to be given the opportunity to come up here and they could share with you the many ways that I have fallen short as a father. So I just want to say that from the very beginning that uh, this certainly uh, is God's word and it's a challenge uh, to me as I have uh, personally studied this uh, throughout the week. But nonetheless, we have before us God's instructions, God's will for cha children and parents. I remind us of the verse that uh, has kind of gone along with this study out of Psalm 127, verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor build it, or those who build it labor in vain. So as God's people, we know that our marriages and our families must be different from the world's. Because we must build our families, build our homes upon the Word of God. And so far in this series of uh, sermons as we've been talking about God's blueprint for the family, we started out with uh, God's design, God's purpose for the wives, for Christian wives. And we found that uh, wives, your, your God-given assignment is to submit or follow your, your husband's loving leadership. And then last week we looked at God's design for husbands and we summed that up in one word. God, God's, God's calling for Christian husbands is to love their wives, to love their wives as Christ loves his bride, the church. And now we come to this issue of children and parents. So this is a two-part or a two, uh, if you're taking notes, two, two points in the sermon today. First of all, in verses 1 through 3, we have God's word to children. What does God's word, or what does God expect uh, from children? Now, you'll notice there in verse 1, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You notice Paul here addresses the children directly. That Greek word that he uses for children is techna. That is a term that can refer to children in the sense of offspring. So in that sense, today, we are all children. We all have parents. So as he was writing this letter, what I find interesting is he is addressing children directly. Certainly, all of us are children, but also the children were present in that assembly when this letter was being read. Now the reason why I point that out is because I think that if we're not careful, uh, churches are, are more and more, they're taking children out of church services. 
And I think that that's a, that, that's, um, that's a dangerous thing to do. Because children, they, they hear more than what we think that they hear. They're learning more than what we think that they are learning. And not only that, but children learn how to be worshipers of God by watching adults worship God. And so Paul here, he addresses children specifically. And he gives the expectation of children. And this is really twofold. He says, first of all, children obey your parents in the Lord. Obey your parents. Now that, that word in the Greek is a, is a present imperative. It's a verb, obviously, so it has an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing command. Children are to consistently obey their parents. Now in order for children to obey their parents, they first must listen to their parents. So he's saying, listen to your parents in order to obey your parents. Now, kind of a parallel passage to this would be Colossians chapter 3, verse 20, where Paul says, obey in everything your parents. So, so he is saying, children, you, you obey everything your parents tell you to do. Now this would, in Paul's time, and certainly in our day as well, this would include children who have believing and non-believing parents. As long as the parents are, are asking their children to do something that, that is uh, biblically okay. In other words, they're not asking their children to do anything that is unbiblical. Children are expected by God to obey their parents in everything. So as children, they are to do what? parents say when parents say to do it. Okay? Do what they say when they say. So children, and you can classify yourself today, children don't ignore your parents, don't argue with your parents, don't talk back to your parents, but obey your parents. Now you notice he says that ultimately when it comes to children obeying their parents that it is a spiritual issue. He says obey your parents in the Lord. As you obey your parents you are ultimately obeying the Lord. You are honoring the Lord. You do this in the Lord he says for this is right. This is the right thing to do. Obedience is right. Now Children will not naturally obey their parents. It has to be expected of them. That's important to understand. I like what Warren Wiersbe once said. He said the modern version of Ephesians 6 verse 1 would be, Parents, obey your children, for this will keep them happy and bring peace to the home. It's interesting to note that disobedience to parents, the Bible tells us, will characterize the last days. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, the Bible says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, listen, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. So it's interesting that he says the characteristic of the last day is, is that specifically children will be disobedient to their parents. Now we don't have to look very far to see this manifested in our culture. I was reading this week about the story of a young man by the name of Daniel Petrick. Listen to Daniel's story. In September of 2007, Daniel was 16 years old. He snuck out of the bedroom of his window to purchase a video game at a store against his father's wishes. When he returned home, his parents caught him with the game and took it from him. His father, who was a minister, put the game in a lockbox in a closet where he also kept a 9mm handgun, according to the prosecutors. About a month later, on October 20th, 2007, Daniel used his father's key to open the lockbox and remove the gun in the game. The boy shot his parents, killing his mother and gravely wounding his father. As his father lay wounded, Daniel tried to place the gun in his father's hand. 
Daniel fled after his sister and her husband arrived at the house, taking the video game with him. So he, 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 he murdered his mother and nearly killed his father, all because his parents had told him no. So certainly we live in, in a day in which disobedience to parents is sadly not an uncommon thing. The Lord says, children, this is God's will for you. Obey your parents. But then he gives a second aspect of this. He says, not only obey your parents, but honor your parents. You see that in the scriptures. Honor your father and mother. He's speaking here of the attitude of the obedience. Proper uh, behavior should be driven by a proper attitude. What is the attitude that children should have towards their parents? It's that of respect. That's what he means by honoring, to show high regard for, to esteem, to value, to revere, to respect. Children are to respect their parents, not disrespect their parents, but to respect. Respect for any kind of authority, church, always begins at home. You understand? Respect for any kinds of authority has to begin at home. If children are not taught, they're not expected at home to show respect for their parents, they will have no respect for any kind of authority whatsoever. This is why we live in a culture in which we have children who have absolutely no respect whatsoever for their teachers at the schoolhouse. That's why they have absolutely no respect for their coaches, for police officers, for their pastors, because they're not expected to have respect for their parents back at the house. He says you are to obey your parents, but you are to honor, respect your parents. Respect your parents. Then he says, this is your motivation. Children, this is your motivation. So we've, we've seen the expectation. Now he says, this is your motivation to obey and honor your parents. Notice what he says. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it may go well with you that you may live long in the land. Now, he gives here a general promise. This is not an absolute promise. In other words, he's not saying, okay... As children, if you obey and honor your parents, you are guaranteed to have a long, fruitful life. But in a general sense, he is saying that children who obey and honor their parents, their lives will go better for them. And in, in many cases, will lengthen their lives. Why is that? Because in a healthy home, parents who set up godly parameters who expect obedience from their children, are not doing that in order to harm their children. They have expectations for their children in order to help their children. Now, I know many children and teenagers find this surprising, but we as adults know a little bit more about life than they do. Amen? And we know some things about them that they may not know because they haven't had life experience. And so if children are wise, they will listen to their parents, even when they don't understand. And with that, it will help them to live a more fruitful life. As they obey their parents, they protect themselves from, from um, getting themselves into trouble, whether that's uh, legal trouble or just relational trouble. In a general sense, obedient parent, or children who obey their uh, parents, who honor their parents, will have a more fruitful life. Uh, life. So that is God's expectation, God's word to children. Now we move on to the second part of our message, and that is in verse 4, and that's God's word to parents. God's word to parents. Notice verse 4. Now here is what is interesting to me, okay? There is one verse for instructions for parents, that's amazing. 
I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but when we had our first child, Nathan, I was scared to death. Oh, man, how in the world are we going to raise this child without totally messing this child up? Anybody have that similar experience? Here's the reality, though. This is what we have to understand. Children are already messed up. Children are already born with a problem. The Bible says in Psalm 51 verse 5 that children are born as sinners. They're born into sin. The book of Proverbs, and I know this is shocking, but the, the book of Proverbs tells us that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. So it's not a matter of us parents saying, how in the world are we going to keep from just really messing this child up? They, they're, they're, born, they're born messed up because sin. The question is, how do we raise our children in such a way that we help them with their sin problem? He doesn't, he doesn't here give uh, uh, ten steps to being a, a great parent. He doesn't give uh, a bunch of uh, politically correct instructions here. He doesn't say, okay, you got to focus on making sure that they understand their self-worth and, and making sure that you guard their self-esteem. No, listen to what he says. He says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, he starts there with that word, fathers. Now, in the original Greek, that could, can be a general term for parents In general, both mom and dad are expected to bring their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But I think in our context, because Paul has just been talking about the father's, the husband's role in the family is to provide leadership. Parenting, the leadership with parenting falls on the father's shoulders. That's important for us to understand that the father is to provide the leadership in this area of parenting. Um, Now, certainly, mothers, praise the Lord for for you godly mothers, because you have such a heavy influence on the children. I mean, I could share all kinds of uh, testimonies of of well-known Christians who had godly mothers at the house. Think about Timothy. Look at Timothy, it talks about how he had a godly mother and grandmother. So thank you, all you mothers. Um, I, I know my children's mother, Michelle, does a wonderful job with our children. Praise the Lord for godly mothers. You have such a strong influence. But I, but I do believe that Paul here is stressing the importance of the father's leadership in the area of parenting. Now he says here there is an error, there is an error for us parents to avoid. You see this? He says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That, parents, is the error that we must avoid. Provoking our children to anger. Now this would have been absolutely foreign, in many cases shocking, to Paul's audience. Because under Roman law, there was such a thing called patria potestas. And that gave a Roman father absolute power over his children as long as they lived. Even into adulthood, as long as the father was alive, he had absolute authority over his children. So listen to this. Under Roman law, at birth... The child would be laid at the father's feet and the father would determine whether or not the child would be accepted into the family or would be killed or thrown out onto the uh, trash heap. As that child was laid at the feet of the father, the father would look at the child If he decided to accept the the, the child, he would reach down and he would pick the child up. If he walked away from the child, the child was to be discarded. All this was lawful under Roman law. Under Roman law, he could treat his children like slaves. 
under Roman law. He could decide. He would decide who they would marry. And if he decided he wanted his children to divorce, they had to be obedient to their father. Under Roman law, he could disinherit his children at any time. At any time, under Roman law, he could enact capital punishment on his children. Again, he had complete authority over his children. And it had little to do with the child's well-being. Listen to this quote from this man named Seneca. He was a Roman statesman. He says this, and I quote, We slaughter a fierce ox. We strangle a mad dog. We plunge the knife into sickly cattle, lest they taint the herd. Children who are born weakly and deformed, we drown. All under Roman law. But notice what Paul says in verse 4. Children or fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath. Fathers, parents... Don't provoke your children to anger. Have concern for the well-being of your children. You see, as Christians, we have a different worldview. We don't act like the world. Therefore, as parents, we ought to be different parents than the lost world around us. That's what Paul is saying. Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Don't provoke them. In other words, don't discourage your children. Don't irritate your children. Don't cause them to be resentful towards you or broken in spirit. Lest they become hopeless and frustrated and just want to give up. Now certainly, there will be times when our children are angry with us. There will be times that they do not agree with our discipline. And the fact of the matter is, they don't have to understand. They just are expected to obey. Amen? But Paul is saying, don't purposely, don't unnecessarily cause your children to be frustrated. That's what he's saying. So how do we avoid, as parents, how do we avoid causing our children to become discouraged? How do we avoid causing, uh, provoking our children to anger? Just a few suggestions here. These are some ways, some things that we can do, if we're not careful, that will provoke them to anger. First one is overprotecting. Overprotecting. This is the helicopter parent. The helicopter mom. Overly protective. This is the parent that their child is still sitting in the booster seat when the child is 100 pounds and 12 years old. (laughs) This is the parent that when the child gets a little scratch, immediately they're going to go to the emergency room. I mean, everything's going to shut down the house. I mean, it's just a frenzy. We're going to get to the emergency room as soon as possible. Overly protective. This is, this is the parent when, when they go to the beach, the child's, the child's going to have a uh, uh, shirt on with sleeves, they're going to have bullfrog, um, you know, sunscreen all, all over their body. Now, sunscreen-wise, certainly, but you get the picture, okay? Overly protective. A, a, a helicopter parent is overly controlling. Or overly controlling. I mean, when their child brings home a paper from school, Child doesn't get 100 immediately. They're going to call the teacher. I I don't understand. My child is smarter than this. You must have done something wrong. You didn't teach teach my child right because my my child is smarter than this. Or or the child gets in a little scuffle on the playground with another child. You know, children are going to do that, by the way. You know that? Children are going to be children. But an overly controlling, protective parent, they're going to immediately pick up the phone, they're going to call that other child's parent, and they're going to find out what that other child did to their child. Overly protective, overly controlling, overly involved. This is the parent when the, when the child is given a, an assignment at school, a, a science project. Guess, cause, guess who's going to do the project? The parent, right? 
make all kinds of excuses for them. That's the overly protective parent. That's the, the helicopter parent. That, that, that can provoke them to wrath. Secondly, is just the opposite, underprotecting. So there's, there's very little involvement at all in the child's life. There are no barriers at all. They, they never say no. There is no structure in the home. There is no guidance. The, the mentality is, I, I let my child decide for themselves. Underprotecting. Thirdly, excessive discipline will provoke our children to wrath. That, that means that it's disciplining too much. There is never any grace given. Excessive discipline. Or discipline that is too hard. It's uncalled for. It's unexplained discipline. Whether that is physically or verbally. Or, number four, instead of excessive discipline, there is no discipline. Lack of discipline. There's inconsistency. A child can get away with anything. Never any correction at all. Because the mentality is, I, I, I want to be my child's friend. I want to be their friend. I, I want them to like me and not be upset with me. Parents, our children were given to us not for us to be their friends. God gave us, to be, to, gave us children in order for us to be their parents. Lack of discipline. Legalism. This is where you use the Bible, you use religion in order to control their outward performance. You want them to, to look good on the outside. You want them to say all the right things, do all the right things. They, they look like the model child so that when they're out in public, they don't embarrass you. Abuse. Physical, emotional. Number seven, favoritism. Why can't you be just like so-and-so's child? Why can't you be like them? Or, or why can't you be like your older brother or your older sister? Always comparing them to another child. Or how about this? Unrealistic goals. This means that you, you're always expecting more from them. They have to be the best student. They, they've got to be the best athlete out there. They never do enough. And you never praise them or reward them for what they have done right. Just always finding ways that they haven't met the goal. It's like they, they get close to meeting your goal and then boom, you bump the goal up a little bit higher. It's just never enough. Typically, this type of parents, they're, they're, they are trying to, to live out their childhood dreams through their children. Overly critical. Always finding fault. Again, never good enough. Never get it right. So the child just finally says, I just give up. I, it doesn't matter what I do. I never, I never get it right. I never do enough. And then number 10, something that we have to avoid doing or we will provoke our children to anger, and that is neglect. N neglecting to meet their physical needs or their emotional needs. Making them feel like they're a burden. Making them feel like you never have time uh, for them. So he says, parents, this is the error that you should avoid. Avoid provoking your children to anger. That's the negative side of the instruction. Now he gives the positive side. This is the instruction parents should provide. The instruction parents should provide. He says, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of of the Lord. So this is, again, this is the positive side to parents' instruction. Again, this is not worldly-minded instruction here. It's not politically correct. This is not much psychobabble. He says, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Again, it goes back to what I said at the beginning about children. Children are born depraved sinners. And our job as parents is, is that we are to do everything with the help of the Holy Spirit to pull our children who are not naturally seeking after God. They're walking away from God. And as parents, it is our job to do everything we can in order to pull them towards God. Because remember, it's not a matter of us, oh no, how am I going to avoid messing up my child? 
they're already born messed up. They're born sinners. It is our job to pull them towards Christ. He says this in, in two different ways. He says, you bring them up. Bring them up, which means nourish them up to maturity. Nourish them up to maturity. You, you provide them the food necessary to bring them to spiritual maturity. So parents, this is what it means for us. We have been called to be pastors to our children. We're to be shepherds, spiritual shepherds to our children. This is twofold. He says, first of all, through discipline. Through discipline. So, so what he means there is that parents are to provide a systematic training, instruction, and righteousness for our children. This is talking about having behavior that is marked by Christian virtues. Teach your child how to live, to walk in such a manner that manifests godly attributes. So parents, we are to discipline our children, which involves sometimes actual discipline. We're to teach our children to be honest people. We're to teach our children to be respectful. We're to teach them to be hardworking, not lazy. Again, disciplining them to have characteristic that, that, is, that is marked by a, a godly Christian, godly Christian virtues, hardworking, responsible, which means as parents we need to teach our children to be financially responsible. Teach them how to save money so that when they... They, they get money. They don't immediately just go out and just spend all their money. Teach them the principle of saving and giving to the Lord. Uh, I, I believe that as, as parents, if we're to discipline our children, if we're to teach them uh, godly behavior, we ought to teach them proper hygiene. Teach them to, to, to brush their teeth, put on deodorant, to put a little comb through their hair every now and then. I think that as fathers, we need to teach our sons how to be gentlemen. And ladies, I think that it's God's expectation of you to teach your daughters how to be Christian ladies. That's the discipline part of it. Again, it includes correction for wrongdoing, training by disciplinary action. Then there's the second part. He says, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Literally, when he says instruction, literally it's put into the mind. Put into the mind. So training by verbal instruction. Training them in what they believe. So the first part involves behavior. The second part is informing their mind so that they have proper belief. Godly belief. Who God is. God is holy. We're to teach them that God is holy. Man is People were sinful. Therefore, we're in need of a, what? A Savior. You see, until a child understands, first of all, that they're lost, they're not going to understand their need for the Savior. So, so helping them, Paul says, the job of the parent is to discipline them, helping them to behave righteously, but then secondly, think righteously. They should be disciplined in their behavior and in their beliefs. Now let me say this. Right behavior without right instruction leads to legalism. And what I mean by that is if all we do is teach our children how to behave right outwardly and we don't address their hearts, then all we do is create little Pharisees. We have to shepherd their hearts. So to sum it up, the job of parents is to consistently point our children to Jesus. Point them to Jesus so that, first and foremost, they come to faith in Jesus Christ. That is our number one priority as parents, to see our children come to faith in Jesus Christ. Notice Paul doesn't say, make sure you pour all of your efforts into, their, into your children so that they are always on the honor roll, so that they go to a great college, so that they get an academic scholarship or an athletic scholarship. 
No, our greatest concern, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, but our first most concern for our children is to see them come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior biblically and then help them to grow in their walk as followers of Christ. That's a pretty, I'm going to say this term loosely, simple instruction. What I mean by that is not complicated. I'm not saying it's easy. But it's pretty clear what, as parents, that's what we've been called to do. And whose responsibility is this? It's the parent's responsibility. It's not the pastor's responsibility to raise your children. It's not the church's responsibility to raise your children. Hey, listen, it's not your child's responsibility to raise themselves. Sometimes I hear this. Well, you know, I, I just, I, I don't want to tell my child. I don't, te- I, I don't tell my child that they got to go to church. I, I let them decide for themselves. I'm just going to let them decide for themselves whether they want to go to church or not. Hey, listen, the moment they're born, they've already decided. The Bible says that none seek after righteousness. You leave your child on their own, I promise you this, they will not naturally on their own say, hey, I'm going to go to church to worship Jesus Christ. That responsibility has been given to us as parents. Now, the church is certainly important in that process. We have to come in and we have to supplement and help parents. But the responsibility, the sole, the, the primary responsibility lies on the parents. The point your children to Jesus Christ. I want to close with this story shared by a man by the name of H.B. Charles Jr. This is what he says. He says, a certain young man made it clear to his father what he wanted for his high school graduation gift, a new car. His father took him to the car dealership and he identified the car that he wanted. It was used and needed a little work, but to this young man it might as well have been a top of the life model right off the assembly line. The last gift he received after his graduation was from his father was a Bible. The young man was crushed. He was angry that his father would go so far as to, make, to take him to a car dealership and pick out a car only to give him such a cheap gift. The boy angrily left home and refused to speak to his father for a long period of time. Then he received the news that his father had become very sick. He went to his father's bedside and they reconciled. When he asked if there was something he could do, his father asked him again to take the Bible that, he had, uh, that had ruptured their relationship. He took it to appease his father, but he could not believe his father would make this Bible an issue again. When the father died, he was asked to read the scripture at the funeral. As he thumbed through that Bible to find an appropriate scripture, he found a card from his father. Inside was a note from his father and a check for the amount of the car he wanted. The note said, Son, I love you, and I'm very proud of you. Here is the money for the car you desire. Enjoy it. But always remember that no gift can be more special than the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Parents, our assignment is great, but our provision is even greater. I want to go back to Ephesians 5, verse 18. Where Paul says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Children, if you're going to obey your parents, if you're going to honor the Lord, you have to be filled with the Spirit. Parents, if we're going to be the parents that God expects us to be, we have to daily say, you know what? I'm not going to walk according to the old man but I'm going to walk according to the new man. I'm going to be controlled by the Spirit. So today, maybe as we come to our time of invitation, maybe today you need to be saved. I'm talking to children today. I'm talking to adults. 
Maybe your need is you need to have a heavenly father. For the very first time in your life, you need to confess your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledge your need for forgiveness. You need to acknowledge that he died on the cross for you and that he rose from the grave. Salvation is available for you today if you will call upon the name of the Lord. Or maybe today you just need to be forgiven. Maybe there's some children, some teenagers. The Spirit of God is speaking to your heart, and you have to acknowledge that you haven't honored your parents. You've been disobedient to your parents. Maybe today you're an adult, but you have parents, and you don't honor your parents. You don't honor them, and you need to ask the Lord to forgive you. You need to repent. Maybe today you're a parent and you say, wow, this message has really just hit me right here. You know what the good news of the Bible is? The Bible tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. I want to go back to what I said last week. God's not the God of a second chance. He's the God of another chance. And I can only speak for myself as a parent. But you know what? I, I need more than just two chances. I need many chances. And there has been many times in my life that I've blown it as a parent. We just got to go back and say, Lord Jesus, forgive. Forgive me for my inconsistency in my, in my discipline. Forgive me for my lack of discipline. Forgive me for failing to lead my children spiritually. Forgive me for getting so focused in this world that I have just kind of let my children wander off spiritually. Forgive me and help me, Lord Jesus and your strength to be the parent that you've called me to be because I want our home to bring honor and glory to your name. Now really this, this, uh, this message applies to all of us because today maybe you don't have children, but today you're a, you're a member of First Baptist Church. We are a church family. And maybe while you, you may not have any earthly children, there are some children here who need some spiritual parents. And you say, you know what, I, I want to invest my life and a child who needs some, some direction in their life. And I'm willing, I'm willing to sacrifice my time and my resources in order to invest in another child that, 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 that's not part of my literal family, but they're part of my spiritual family, and I want to show them how to be committed followers of Jesus Christ. You do whatever the Lord leads you to do as we have our hymn of invitation. As our musicians pr uh, uh, come to prepare, I want to lead us in a word of prayer. Father, Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the clarity of your word. Lord, we, we thank you for the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I think if we'd all be honest today, we'd all have to say that we have all failed. We have all fallen short. But Lord, we're just reminded again of our great need for a Savior. Lord, we thank you that you, you died for each and every one of our sins so that we could have relationship with you. And Lord, today I want to pray for any children here today, any teenagers who maybe they need to get right with you. They're, they're not being obedient to their parents. They're being rebellious toward their parents, and, and you're, you're convicting their hearts. I, I pray that they would confess that. If they're not saved, that they would get saved today. If they're, if they're sa saved, they just need to repent. Lord, I pray that they would get that right. As parents, Lord, if we, if we just need to come to these altars and, and do some business with you and we need to pray for our, our families, Lord Jesus, may we do whatever you lead us to do. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace, Lord Jesus. We thank you that in Christ there is no condemnation. But Lord, we thank you for your word that leads us and guides us. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name.